All right. Hello, everyone, and happy Thanksgiving week. I hope you're all doing well and staying safe and healthy. And welcome and thanks for coming to our final Climate People and Environment Program seminar of the semester. It's hard to believe. Um, and stay tuned. I'll give you some word about next semester and at the end of the talk. Uh, I'm Ankur Desai, for those who don't know, I'm the Climate People Environment Program uh, Reed Bryson Professor and organizer of the seminar series. And it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, David Stern, who uh, is another one of our speakers that we had to reshuffle at the uh, beginning of the pandemic. And um, we we're glad that we could get you back and uh, that you agreed, uh, even though we couldn't do this in person. I think this is still great. Um, just by way of background, uh, David Stern uh, did his undergraduate at the University of Virginia, uh, where he studied with, uh, conducted research with Deborah Roach, um, and then uh, went ahead and did a PhD at the George Washington University um, with Keith Crandall in the Computational Biology Institute, where he studied genetic basis of vision loss in cave crayfishes. Um, so some pretty cool and a variety of research on, on biology and interactions with the environment. And now he's here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, he's currently a postdoctoral scholar with uh, Professor Carol Lee in integrative biology. He has a uh, NIH project that's focusing on the genetic basis of adaptation to novel environments. And I thought this would be a fun seminar to bring into our climate people environment series where we tend often to focus a lot on the physical climate system. Uh, but here really kind of looking at more the biological side of how does these type of climate changes that folks uh, often in CCR spend a lot of time looking at really manifest themselves in terms of understanding organisms. And so I'm really excited about this because this is a topic I know virtually nothing about. So I think just about every sentence and every slide will teach me something new. And I think that's going to be true for um, other folks in the audience. Um, as usual, please keep on mute uh, and uh, feel free to add questions anytime during the chat. I will monitor if there are any issues or questions. Just go ahead and bring those up and we'll let you go from there. And so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Stern here and uh, let you share your screen. Great. Yeah, I will share my slides now. Looks great. And yep. See this okay? Everything looks great. Yeah, here. great. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for having me. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, again, my name is David Stern. I'm a postdoc in the Department of Integrative Biology. And today I'm going to share with you um, some of my research that I've been working on here at the University of Wisconsin, uh, trying to understand evolutionary mechanisms of adaptation to novel in changing salinity using genetic and genomic techniques. So I'm gonna kind of present uh, some of kind of an evolutionary biology uh, perspective of you know, how we think about responses to changing climates um, and changing environments. And I imagine a lot of what I'm going to talk about in terms of techniques and background might be uh, unfamiliar to many of you. So please feel free to stop me throughout to, to ask questions and yeah, I hope you learned something new. So um, one of the maybe underappreciated uh, outcomes of changing climates is that uh, coastal waters, especially in the higher latitudes, are expected to become much fresher in upcoming decades due to increased ice melt and precipitation uh, and other factors. Uh, an example here is in the, the Baltic Sea that I'll come back to later. Um, this is in, in Europe, this somewhat salty brackish water, uh, a body of water that's connected to the Atlantic Ocean. And by the end of the century, much of it is predicted to become almost entirely fresh. Uh, and this is a major problem for populations and ecosystems living in these coastal habitats because salinity is a major structurer and driver of aquatic communities and, and geographic distributions for the species. Um, as you know, even Homer Simpson can tell here from his little experiments, uh, most aquatic organisms are highly um, restricted in the range of salinities that they can tolerate. And because of this, uh, salinity has, is a major factor driving where exactly uh, organisms can, or, or populations um, can live in space and what type of habitats they will live in as, as evidenced here in the, in the Baltic Sea again. And so as this important environmental uh, factor changes rapidly, um, we don't really understand how most populations will be able to respond. Uh, and 
you know, three of the kind of possible uh, outcomes are that populations could go extinct. Um, they could potentially migrate to a different location that has more tolerable conditions, or they could actually potentially undergo adaptive evolution in order to tolerate these new conditions. And you might be thinking, you know, evolution is this slow, gradual process. How is this going to operate on contemporary timescales? Uh, however, you know, one of the most, uh, in my opinion, interesting discoveries of the last few decades in biology is that, in fact, um, evolution can be a really rapid process that can happen on contemporary timescales and in just a few generations. And there are tons of examples of this now, um, but here are some from, from our lab, the Lee Lab, uh, where we study this animal on the top right uh, called a copepod. It's a small planktonic crustacean, about a millimeter in size, and it lives in salty coastal waters. Um, but recently, in the last 50 years or so, it has invaded freshwater habitats like the Great Lakes. Uh, and during these invasions, the freshwater invasive populations have actually um, evolved, increased freshwater survival, and decreased saltwater survival in just a few generations. So it's a, a rapid evolutionary process uh, to this new environment. And this has been accompanied by um, rapid evolution in ion transporter protein activities and important physiological processes that allow these organisms to survive in fresh water. So given that you know, we know evolution can happen really rapidly, uh, this means that we can or need to take this into account when we're thinking about how species and populations are going to respond to environmental change. And if we can identify the intrinsic or the genetic and the extrinsic or environmental factors that might be able to promote adaptation to new environments, uh, then perhaps we could predict uh, evolutionary responses to this environmental change and potentially use this to inform ecosystem management or conservation strategies. And so uh, the way we think about this is, well, I'm going to you know, use evolutionary genetics to um, try to work through these problems. And just so that we're all on the same page, I was going to give a quick uh, two minute crash course in genetics, um, just so you can understand the type of techniques and topics that I'll be talking about. Uh, so every organism on the planet from, you know, bacteria to plants and animals uh, have their genetic material in the form of some type of chromosomes, which are made up of DNA, which is the heritable genetic material that provides the molecular blueprint for the body's development, physiology, and behavior. Uh, stretches of DNA that code for proteins and other biomolecules that do things in the body um, are called genes. And the entire sequence of DNA across all of the chromosomes is called the genome. So it's all of, all of the genes in, the, in, the, in a cell. And uh, mutations are, well, the DNA is made up of uh, a string of consecutive molecules called uh, bases or nucleotide bases that we abbreviate to uh, four different letters, A, C, G, and T. And mutations are changes to the identity and the order of the DNA sequence. And that will create genetic variation or alleles that may or may not have an effect on the genotype. So this is kind of the stuff of evolution. And I'll refer to this as these as either mutations or genetic variants or alleles. Um, and these changes to the DNA can, as I mentioned, have no effect on the phenotype or they could have an important effect on your traits or phenotype. So maybe an A, a change from an A to a G at one position might have no effect, a change to an A to a C, might turn this little critter on the right uh, from black to yellow, and or an A to a T might have a negative effect causing disease or death. And so from an evolutionary standpoint, well, first I'll uh, uh, define adaptation um, from an evolutionary standpoint as evolutionary change driven by natural selection that makes a population better fitted uh, better suited to its environment. So you can imagine if there's some genetic variation in a population where one of those uh, mutants has a higher probability of leaving offspring to the next generation, and this change is heritable, it's passed on to the next generation, then it's just a mathematical certainty that over time, over generations, uh, that mutation will become more frequent in a population. And this is a population genetic um, definition of natural selection. Another way to look at this is if you have some 
continuous trait that varies in a population, maybe body size, and maybe larger individuals have a higher probability of leaving offspring to the next generation. And again, this, uh, this is a heritable change. Then in upcoming generations, the population on average will become larger in size. And so in order to investigate this type of uh, natural selection process, what we do is uh, look at the DNA sequence of individuals um, in a population. So this is kind of shown on the, on the top right here. We might have some reference DNA sequence as shown in green. And we can sequence chunks of DNA from individuals in a population and look at uh, what types of mutations are present and how they're distributed. And from here, uh, look for specific signatures that natural selection leaves on the genome. Uh, so this is the type of technic techniques that I will uh, talk about and that I use in my research. And so again, we want to be able to predict uh, the, the responses to the potential evolutionary responses to environmental change. And this can happen through a number of different uh, factors. The ones that I'm going to focus on and that I think are uh, you know, the most interesting pressing topics and outgo uh, outstanding questions in the field are uh, first, what is the role of standing genetic variation? So this is the idea that you already have some genetic variants in a population, let's say uh, here on the top, uh, you, you're uh, in, a, in a saltwater environment and there's some, let's say in black are some saltwater adapted individuals and maybe a few freshwater adapted individuals. And if these are already here, and once this population is exposed to a new environmental pressure, like fresh water here, and this uh, freshwater individual is now uh, advantaged, then this population can undergo rapid evolution and uh, recover from this change. Um, alternatively, if there's no variation in the population relative to this environmental change, then the population might undergo some decline unless at some point over time, a new mutation can arise that provides some advantage, and this may or may not happen. So we know that this process, this idea of standing genetic variation, is really important for rapid evolution to novel environments. But uh, an out outstanding question is how exactly is standing genetic variation maintained in populations? Why exactly would this saltwater uh, population have a freshwater adapted individual? And I'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, another really important factor is what's called the genetic architecture of adaptation. And if you're thinking about the different mutations that might contribute to an evolutionary response, uh, the knowing the number present their effects on on the on adaptation, their mm -hmm. abundance and, and distribution in a population, and how they're distributed in the genome will impact the probability rate and predictability of adaptation patients in novel environments. So on this figure on the left, each box represents a different chromosome and each red line represents a mutation. And these are just a few different examples of different genetic architectures where you might have a small number of mutations with large effects, many mutations spread across the genome with small effects or ones that are clustered together in the genome. And this is important because mutations that are close together tend to be inherited together. So this is really going to, as I mentioned, impact how exactly populations are going to respond and how quickly they can do so. So today I'm going to talk about a, number, a few different projects um, focused on the factors that can promote rapid adaptation to novel salinity conditions. Uh, first, I will talk about the role of environmental heterogeneity and uh, environmental fluctuations in time and how they can promote the maintenance of standing genetic variation and rapid adaptation into uh, during freshwater invasions. Uh, then I'll talk about the role of genetic architecture using an experimental evolution approach and uh, link this to the role of environmental heterogeneity in space and how this can lead to local adaptation in space. Okay, so first is the role of environmental fluctuations. Uh, so, my advisor, Carol Lee, and uh, Greg Golumbic uh, noticed uh, about 10 years ago that many invasive species, invaders of freshwater habitats, actually originated from more saline habitats, um, especially uh, particularly ones that have seasonal variation in salinity. And this includes a lot of important invaders of places like Great Lakes, um, well, Asian carp. It's not in the Great Lakes, but uh, Asian carp, zebra mussels, and killer shrimp. 
are some examples that came from saltwater habitats. And uh, so this leads to the hypothesis that maybe fluctuating environments and fluctuating selection pressures could help maintain genetic variation and promote adaptation to novel environments. So if you imagine you have some native range habitat where uh, maybe it's fresher in the spring, um, let's say it's an estuary where you have a lot of river runoff and it's fresher in the spring, and then as there's evaporation over the year, it becomes uh, saltier. If you have some organism living there that has a long generation time and experiences all of these different conditions, then uh, this would lead to the evolution potentially of tolerance or, or environmental plasticity for these different conditions. Alternatively, if you have a short generation time, like what's present in a lot of invertebrate and plankton uh, species, then uh, different generations are going to be exposed to these different selection pressures. And this can result in what's called a balancing selection effect, where maybe in the fall when it's saltier, there are more saltwater adapted individuals. Then in the spring when it's fresher, you have more freshwater adapted individuals. And this can cause a fluctuation in these different genetic variants over time and a long-term maintenance of genetic variation. However, uh, it's long been thought that the conditions under which this fluctuating selection uh, phenomenon can maintain variation um, are very limited. And this is because genetic variation needs to be protected from strong bouts of selection. You can imagine if it's really, really fresh in the spring, then maybe all the saltwater individuals die off and then you lose that, uh, that genetic variation going forward. And furthermore, uh, whether or not this mechanism can facilitate adaptation to environments that are beyond the current conditions uh, experienced in this uh, hypothetical native range are, are unknown. Uh, so to investigate this question, whether or not fluctuating selection can promote adaptation, uh, performed or well, we focused studies on, uh, again, this copepod, Uritemera affinis. And this is, as I mentioned, this small planktonic crustacean about a millimeter in size, and it's a major supporter of uh, estuaries and other coastal habitats across the northern hemisphere. And it is a uh, technically a species complex, meaning that there are a number of different kind of subspecies that are genetically divergent from one another. And a number of these in recent, uh, recent decades has invaded uh, freshwater habitats like the Great Lakes, um, uh, mediated by human transport. And the reason that the reasons that this is a nice model system to study this question is because, as I mentioned previously, uh, the species has undergone rapid freshwater adaptation during these freshwater invasions. So it's uh, undergone evolved increases to freshwater tolerance on a really short time scales. In the native range, it experiences fluctuating salinity conditions. So it lives in places like in estuaries or salt marshes, uh, like this shown on the left here where salinity varies seasonally from around 5 to 40 PSU. Uh, it has short generation times, around six generations per year, meaning that different generations are going to be exposed to different salinities. Uh, it shows negative genetic correlations between freshwater and saltwater tolerance. So a better you know, salt, freshwater tolerant individual has less fresh saltwater tolerance and vice versa, meaning that these traits are differentially favored in different generations. And it has uh, egg banks that are uh, maintained in the soil and can uh, are, are not exposed to the environment and then can therefore protect genetic variation from strong bouts of, of environmental change or selection. And because of all these conditions, it makes it uh, possible that balancing or fluctuating selection could help to maintain genetic variation. And that could be why it's been able to invade freshwater habitats. So specifically the hypothesis that the same genes that are under balancing selection or fluctuating selection in the native range population are responsible for freshwater adaptation during invasions. And this is important because this could provide a mechanism for how some populations are able to rapidly adapt to novel environments, uh, provided that they originate from these fluctuating environments. They have short generation times relative to the period of fluctuation, uh, yep, of fluctuation, yep and a mechanism to protect genetic variation. And it turns out these conditions might actually be quite common, especially for um, invertebrate and other types of crustacean species. All right, so to, to test this hypothesis, what we did was we collected uh, copepods from 
at different sites in North America from both the, well, from two different uh, groups of populations. Here in red is called the Atlantic group, and in green is called the, blue green is called the Gulf group. And we collected from both native uh, saline ranges and from invaded freshwater ranges. Um, in the darker colors are the, the native ranges, and in, in lighter colors are the invaded ranges. And what we did was perform a whole genome sequencing for around 100 individual copepods from each population. And with these data, what we can do is identify mutations in the genome uh, or genetic variants, specifically ones called single nucleotide polymorphisms, uh, which are abbreviated to SNPs. And this is, I'll be talking about SNPs a lot. These are the most common genetic variant found uh, in, in nature. This is just a, what's called a single point mutation where if you look at this box on the left, bottom left here, you can imagine each line of letters represents a DNA sequence or part of a DNA sequence from a single individual. And at one single position, maybe 30% of individuals have an A and 70% have a C. And as the frequencies of these two genetic variants change, over space or over time, then that can indicate the action of um, an evolutionary process changing the frequencies of those um, two genetic variants relative to each other. So uh, with these data, what we can do first is reconstruct the evolutionary history of these populations. So this is shown a uh, reconstructed evolutionary history shown on the left here. If you're looking at this, which is called a phylogenetic tree, looking from the left to the right, Populations that are clustered together on, on close, uh, close branches are more closely related. So what this is showing is that the uh, Atlantic and the Gulf groups are very genetically divergent from each other. And again, the darker colored uh, sites represent the native saline ranges and the lighter colored sites represent the invaded ranges. And what this tree implies is that uh, there have been multiple independent invasions, at least one in the red group here and two in the uh, in the blue green group here uh, and so using this information we can then look for signatures of natural selection in the genome at these uh, SNPs so this is what we do we look for um, SNPs whose frequencies change repeatedly and dramatically when populations move from salt water to fresh water so here on this plot each gray line represents the frequency of a single SNP of, you know, maybe an A relative to a C. And you can see that most of these are much, have a frequency that's much lower in the saltwater populations than in the invasive freshwater populations. And the fact that this happens repeatedly across all of these different invasion events uh, indicates a strong signature of natural selection. And we applied this type of test to around half a million SNPs uh, in the genome and found that around 347 of them exhibit this significant signature of selection. And uh, what's particularly important is that this does happen at the same exact uh, genes across all of these independent invasion events in these different groups. Our next, so we have the genes or, or SNPs that are responsible for adaptation to fresh water. And next we can ask, do those same SNPs uh, responsible for adaptation to freshwater also harbor signatures of balancing or fluctuating selection in the native range populations. So to test that, what we can do is scan the native range population genomes for the signature of balancing selection using these two statistics uh, that I won't get into here, um, but, uh, and then see, you know, whether the uh, SNPs under selection in the invaded, po invaded populations also have these signatures of balancing selection in the native range. And just to kind of get to the punchline, uh, we do find that that's the case. Freshwater adaptation SNPs also show signatures of balancing selection in the native range populations. So in this plot here, stronger, uh, lower NCD2 scores mean stronger signatures of balancing selection, higher beta scores mean stronger signatures of balancing selection. And uh, the scores for those SNPs found in the whole genome are found in gray, and in blue are just those ones associated with freshwater adaptation. And you can see a pretty clear shift to the right and down, meaning that those same SNPs that show the signature of freshwater adaptation also show signatures of balancing selection in the native range population. Uh, and this is evident in 
two of these, or all, really all four of the uh, native range populations that we sampled, um, even though they're very genetically divergent from each other. So this is strong, uh, strong support um, in favor of our hypothesis that balancing selection is promoting adaptation to novel environments, novel salinity in this case. Uh, we also found that the signatures of selection in the genome do likely have a functional significance related to ion transport, which is an important physiological process related to osmoregulation. That's likely important in freshwater. Uh, on the top here, we're looking at a section representation of a piece of the genome. And each of these kind of light blue boxes near the top represent uh, regions that code for specific proteins known to be related to ion transport. And in B, um, each dot here represents an individual SNP. And on the y-axis, it's a signature of natural selection or adaptation during invasions uh, of freshwater. And so there are, uh, and blue ones are ones that are under selection in each individual or in multiple um, invasion events. And so we have a lot of these SNPs that are highly significant for freshwater adaptation. And on the bottom uh, in C are the signatures of balancing selection in all four of the native range populations. So the point is that this same region of the genome that harbors these genes associated with ion transport have both these signatures of freshwater adaptation uh, during invasions and balancing or fluctuating selection in the native range populations. So main, main takeaways from this part is that independent invasive populations tend to respond to selection through use of the same SNPs and genes. And those genes associated with adaptation to freshwater are subject to balancing selection in the native range population. So this is support for our idea that balancing or fluctuating selection in the native range can help to maintain standing genetic variation that then enables rapid adaptation to novel salinity conditions. Again, provided that um, populations originate from environments that have these fluctuating conditions, uh, the organisms experience short generation times relative to those periods of fluctuation, and there's some mechanism to prevent, uh, to protect genetic variation. All right, so in this project, I was focused on environmental factors that can help to promote uh, evolution and adaptation to new environments, or changing environments. And now I'm going to switch gears a bit and focus on uh, just genetic factors that can potentially promote adaptation to new environments. Uh, specifically, I'll talk about the genetic architecture of adaptation. And this is this, it uh, goes back to this kind of all uh, longstanding question and uh, genetics about whether adaptation is controlled by just one or a few genes. Some examples, an example includes uh, lactase persistence in Europeans, where there's just one or a couple genes known to be associated with that trait, or um, whether adaptation is controlled by many genes and is instead which would be called polygenic. Examples include human height and basal metabolic rate, where hundreds or thousands of genes have been shown to be associated with that trait. Uh, and so now if we're thinking about adaptation to a novel environment, there might be some uh, variation in, in trait in the population, let's say it's salinity tolerance, uh, where you know, on, uh, there's some mean in the population, some variation around that, where some are uh, less tolerant of salt, fresh water, some are more tolerant of fresh water. And if now there's a shift in the optimum, uh, value because you're moving into a new environment, this population could reach this new adaptive optimum in one of two kind of classical ways. The first would be if you have a more simple genetic basis, uh, selective sweeps at individual genes. And what this means is you might have a new mutation that arises in a population shown in this red line here, starts at low frequency. And because it's really advantageous now in this new uh, environment, it rises really rapidly in just a few generations to become very common in the population. And this can happen repeatedly at multiple genes uh, in order for this population to reach a new ad adaptive optimum. Alternatively, if you have a more polygenic uh, response or a polygenic trait, then you would instead expect just really subtle uh, and small frequency shifts at many genes in a population and you could still reach the same new adaptive optimum as all of the genes are contributing a small bit to, uh, to the trait. Uh, 
And distinguishing between these two different models is really important because this will determine how exactly populations are going to adapt to novel environments. And also importantly, um, the genetic architecture might determine whether or not we can actually predict evolutionary responses in nature. Uh, this is because under the this kind of selective sweep model, we'd expect that evolution can be very parallel at the genetic level, meaning that the same mutations could underlie adaptation across different evolutionary events, across different populations exposed to the same new environment. Uh, however, if um, under this polygenic model, we'd expect non-parallelism, where different populations could adapt through the use of different mutations, a different combination of mutations that are contributing to the same trait. All right, so that's what we want to be able to distinguish, uh, particularly as we're thinking about um, the Baltic Sea. And this, this project is focused on the Baltic Sea, where um, uh, currently it's, uh, it exhibits a salinity gradient, where it's saltier in the south and fresher in the north and in these uh, bays. And uh, in upcoming decades, it's expected to become much fresher due to increased um, ice melt, precipitation, and other factors. And we don't know how populations are going to respond. So in order to determine whether or not they may be able to undergo um, evolutionary change, we need to be able to understand the genetic architecture of this potential response. So that's what we want to do, uh, again, using our copepod, Yuri Tamara, Axinus. And specifically, we want to ask, is salinity adaptation a simple or complex response in the genome? And can we use this information to predict freshwater survival in the wild? So a major challenge, however, is that detecting the genomic targets of natural selection becomes more and more difficult as adaptation becomes more complex, more polygenic, and you just expect these relatively subtle changes in a population. So to overcome this challenge, uh, what I decided to do was use a laboratory natural selection approach. And so here, instead of um, instead of studying wild populations, what we do is take some some populations into the lab, take some copepods into the lab, and uh, maintain them as individual replicate lines. And so here's an example here um, showing two of these lines. Each beaker is about a liter of water in there, and probably about 500 individual copepods, even though you can't see them. And so uh, by having these individual evolutionary replicates um, and this, this replicated and controlled experimental design, we can gain power to, uh, to detect these potentially subtle signatures of natural selection. So specifically what we did is we had uh, 14 independent replicate lines with around uh, 500 individual copepods in each. We started the experiment at high salinity conditions around 15 PSU. And 10 of the lines were designated our treatment lines that were exposed to fresh water for 10 generations uh, and allowed to evolve. Uh, each generation is only about 20 days. And four of the lines were maintained as controls that were just kept at a constant salinity throughout the duration of the experiment. And then we sampled uh, 50 copepods from each line at the start of the experiment and at the end. And um, performed uh, whole genome sequencing again on each line to look for uh, SNP mutations and the frequencies in each line. And by looking at the change in the SNP frequencies uh, across um, from the start of the experiment to the end and across the different lines, then we could uh, detect signatures of natural selection in the genome. So specifically, the signatures we wanted to detect uh, were designed to take into account the fact that a change in frequency of these SNPs over time in a population could just happen randomly due to random sampling from one generation to the next. But if it happens consistently across multiple lines, then that's strong evidence for natural selection. So what we're looking at on the left here is uh, a, um, a data for a single SNP uh, and its frequency in, in, the pop, in the lines. Each line is represented by a different color. So here it means you maybe you have 40% A's, 60% T's, and over time the frequencies of, of A in each line will change. And if it changes uh, rather dramatically and consistently over multiple lines, then that uh, would indicate the action of natural selection driving that change in frequency. Also, we can use the fact that we had control lines wherein those 
control lines as displayed in, in black here, you would just expect potentially random changes in frequency and not in any consistent direction for a given SNF. Uh, whereas instead, if you have consistent changes in the, in the treatment lines, then that would indicate the action of natural selection. So we performed these tests on around 400,000 SNPs that we measured in the genome to detect those that have the signatures of natural selection. And the first thing that we found is that there were around 1,156 of these SNPs with signatures of natural selection, and they were spread widely across the genome. So uh, the plot on the left, each SNP, each dot represents an individual SNP, and on the y-axis is the significance of this selection signature. So those that are above the red or the blue lines are significant for this uh, uh, signature of selection. And here they're grouped, grouped into the four main chromosomes of this copepod. So you can see that the significant ones, are the ones that are responding to selection are spread widely across the genome. And there are a lot of them. Uh, so this is pointing to, uh, again, a, a, or it's pointing to a polygenic response, meaning that there are many genes responding to, to natural selection. Uh, based on where these mutations fall in the genome, we can identify potential functional targets based on what type of proteins they might affect and physiological processes. Uh, kind of as expected, we identified a lot related to ion transport, chloride channels, uh, transmembrane transport, things that we thought are involved in osmoregulation. The most interesting thing is that we found a lot of the exact same genes under selection in this experiment as we found in previous uh, studies, the previous study that I showed of wild populations in North America, suggesting that there might be limited paths to, uh, to freshwater adaptation. Uh, so next we wanted to, again, see if we could distinguish between the two models of genetic architecture um, based on how, uh, based on the effects of these different mutations. So what we see is actually that there are a pretty heterogeneous response where we see both large and small changes in frequency um, shown on the left here the shift in frequency from the start of the experiment at generation six and generation 10 for our selected SNPs and we could also use this information to uh, estimate each mutation's effect on survival which is shown here on the right in yellow those effects for the non-selected SNPs and in purple for the selected SNPs and the main takeaway here is that we don't see just a lot of small, subtle shifts or large uh, changes in frequency or sweeps. Um, instead, we see kind of a more mixed heterogeneous response. So it's not fitting into one of the two models that I presented earlier. And next, we wanted to know how repeatable is this response across replicate lines? Just to kind of orient you here, you can imagine in this cartoon example, two different replicate lines that are going to adapt to a new, uh, as adaptive optimum or adapt to fresh water. And you can imagine that replicate one might be able to reach this new uh, trade optimum by changing frequencies to these blue and, uh, and green genetic variants as these other genetic variants go down in frequency. Whereas this other replicate could adapt through changes to these other genetic variants, uh, the, these other colors that are increasing in frequency in the population while these other decline. And this is uh, assuming the interchangeable effects of these different mutations on the trait or the ability to survive freshwater. And the expectation is that with more genes, you would expect more heterogeneity among replicates and therefore a less predictable response. All right, so to quantify this in our real data, what we did was look at the pairwise overlap between replicate lines in terms of which, uh, meet, uh, which genes are responding to selection. Uh, and this is shown here in pairwise similarity at generation six and generation 10. And what we see is that this pairwise similarity uh, increases rather dramatically over time from generation six to generation 10. And by generation 10, over 90% of the selected SNPs are actually shared across replicates. So it seems like in a rather dramatic way, the exact same genes are under selection across each of the replicate lines. But to understand whether or not this is more or less than we would expect. Uh, what we could do is simulate data under these different models presented here of, of genetic architecture and develop expectations for you know, what degree of parallelism or repeatability 
uh, should we expect and which scenario matches our real data. So again, I'm going to show results of simulating data under the selective suite model, where each, each gene is acting independently, or a polygenic shift model, where these are all, uh, you expect many small changes to, to a lot of genes. So since we know that there are a lot of genes responding to, to selection here, I'll show the results from the polygenic shift model. And uh, the degree of overlap or parallelism is shown in gray. What we find is something that is much, much less uh, a parallel than what we found in our real data. So when you simulate under this model, uh, these different lines can adapt through changes to different genes because they're all contributing in the same way to uh, the new adaptive response. If we simulate under the other model, the selective suite model, we do find something that is closer to our real data where we see more similarity between replicate lines, but still less than what we see in our real data. So what's showing is that our, our real replicate lines are responding in a way that's much more parallel, much more repeatable than what we'd expect under these two models of genetic architecture. So to try to figure out what's going on here, um, we take advantage of, we took advantage of the effects that uh, through simulations, you can show that the response becomes more parallel or more repeatable as fewer genes are contributing to adaptation. You can show here on the y-axis is overlap and on the x-axis is the number of genes contributing to adaptation. So as you have fewer genes contributing, you get more, more similarity among replicate lines just in simulations. And when we get to a number of genes around just 30 or so, uh, then that's what we find is most similar to our real data in terms of repeatability of this process across replicate lines. So this is uh, indicating potentially that our mutations that are important for adaptation to fresh water are acting in a cooperative fashion, and maybe the same combination is favored by selection rather than favoring each mutation independently. And the last interesting thing that we found in this experiment was that selection, selection tended to act on mutations that were really common in the starting uh, freshwater, uh, starting saltwater population. So here is showing the frequency distribution of those uh, SNPs, how they started the experiment before they responded to selection. A lot of them started really rare at low frequency, um, but a lot were actually in high frequency individuals in the saltwater population had these mutations that seem to respond positively to fresh water. Uh, and this is a really surprising result. It's showing that some of the freshwater adapted mutations are already common in the saltwater population. Uh, and this is a really odd distribution, one that's not expected. On the one hand, this is showing high adaptive potential for these uh, saltwater populations, but it begs the question of, well, how exactly did they get there? Why does the saltwater population have these mutations that appear to confer an adaptive advantage in, so, uh, in fresh water. So the, the population that we used to start this experiment was derived from this high salinity site in the Baltic Sea. Um, but as I mentioned, the Baltic Sea shows this variation in salinity latitudinally. So you can imagine if there are animals that are locally adapted to the freshwater conditions that you know, have these uh, mutations that confer freshwater advantage in these other parts of the Baltic Sea, and there's movement or migration among different sites, and that could uh, introduce those freshwater adapted mutations into the saltwater population. Uh, to, so to see if this is actually happening, uh, what we did was uh, go to the Baltic Sea and collect copepods across the range, um, across a variation in salinity, and there's a lot of this was done in, in the uh, in, together with a, a graduate student in the lab, Juanita. And what we did is again perform whole genome sequencing for these different populations. And if this mechanism was operating to help uh, promote adaptation, uh, then what we'd expect is that the genes underlying freshwater adaptation that we found in the experiment should also show signatures of selection to this natural gradient in salinity in the Baltic. To test this, uh, what, what I did was uh, use those, um, those mutations that we found in the experiment to calculate freshwater survival scores or perform genomic predictions of freshwater survival for the wild Baltic Sea populations. Uh, so here on this plot, each dot represents one of those populations from the Baltic Sea 
and on the y-axis is a calculated freshwater survival score just based on the genomic information and on the x-axis is the mean annual salinity from the site uh, that we collected it in and we do find that the ones that are derived from more freshwater locations in the baltic uh, do tend to have more of those freshwater adapted uh, mutations so they have higher freshwater survival scores than the ones from the saltier parts of the baltic and this is showing evidence for local adaptation, meaning that populations are adapted to local salinity conditions uh, in the Baltic Sea. And then to kind of bring the story together, um, using this genomic data, we can again reconstruct the evolutionary history of these populations, as shown in the, the phylogeny on the left, where you could see that uh, populations that are closer in space tend to be more closely related and clustered together in this tree. Uh, however, Despite this geographic clustering of genetic diversity, we can use a statistic to look for evidence of migration among these populations and the signatures of that in the genome. And we do find strong support for this, this migration from, as shown in the yellow lines here, uh, not only really geographically distant sites, but ones that are inhabiting uh, quite different salinity conditions. So what this is showing is that despite adaptation to local salinity conditions, a migration or physical movement of these copepods across space could be moving those adapted alleles or those adapted mutations across space. And this could help explain why the saltwater adapted population at the start of our experiment already had a lot of these uh, freshwater important mutations present. So to uh, the main takeaways from this part are that adaptation to novel salinity appears to proceed through uh, a heterogeneous polygenic complex response. However, the repeatability that we see across replicate lines is much higher than expected given the, the, the number of genes responding, pointing to a high degree of predictability in the wild, uh, meaning that we could potentially use this information to help understand and predict uh, future responses to salinity change. In addition, uh, spatial variation in salinity and migration among populations could help to maintain genetic variation across space, and this process could help facilitate uh, adaptation to future changes in salinity. So uh, yeah, with that, I'd just like to thank uh, my, my lab and funding sources and collaborators, and I'd be happy to take any questions. And yeah, thank you. Wonderful. Uh, Wonderful. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot. So open it up for any questions. And I think since, um, and thank you for giving us our, our bio 101 lessons and reminders as well, so that we're uh, on the same page as you. It's pretty remarkable actually to me, just one, how much you can learn from sequencing and also just um, how kind of things fit theory so clearly sometimes. So there is one question on this chat here. It says from Jacob Reese, uh, has there already been significant biodiversity loss due to changes in salinity in certain environments? If so, what proportion of biodiversity loss in aquatic position, aquatic species to date is due to salinity changes in the species environment? Yeah, I don't know if a great answer to that question. I know that a lot of people are studying this. There's probably you know, people more on the ecology side. Um, Particularly in the Baltic Sea, there's def definitely been some pretty obvious changes to the composition of the ecosystems and, you know, massive, uh, already massive declines in certain populations. Uh, I think it's unclear whether or not it's directly related to salinity at this point, but um, that's just my estimation. I think uh, probably other people would know the answer to that. Yeah, I, I would, I would because looking at your your some of your experiments, especially with uh, with the Baltic Sea and the Gulf of Bothnia, those are pretty large salinity gradients, right? Compared to like the typical trends we're seeing, say in the ocean. Yeah. Okay. But it's obviously it's, it's, it's a, mm. that's a, that's a massive change in salinity. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, that's really cool. That's a it's a nice natural experiment, basically, which is kind of neat to see. Um, another question from Karen Russ is kind of, she asks, mentions in parentheses, it's a basic question, but how do you do genetic sequencing? Yeah. Something that's um, it's changed over time and it's a technology that's rapidly, rapidly changing and developing. And kind of the basics is that you 
extract some, uh, take some tissue from an organism or grind up a whole organism in this case, as they're very tiny, and extract the DNA uh, in the lab. And then uh, you either shear the DNA into many small pieces that can be easily read in a sequencer or now uh, technology is available that can read huge stretches of DNA. Um, but basically you just prepare the DNA in a special way that allows a uh, sequencing machine to tag the different four different bases and usually read them with some kind of laser or other type of uh, chemistry um, that can get this get the DNA. But most of what we do nowadays is just extract DNA and send it to a, a sequencing center and get back the data. Cool, thanks. Yeah, I gather it's gotten a lot faster too with time in terms of turning those things around. So uh, Mike Goodman asks, uh, is the decrease in salinity levels due primarily to glacial breakup? And I assume this is related to your Baltic Sea study. Factors, I'm not sure the specific role of glacial breakup, but um, I mean, ice melt uh, and, and river runoff is a major factor. Another one is actually um, changing wind patterns in the Baltic Sea because there's exchange between the Atlantic Ocean and the Baltic Sea, and if uh, this exchange changes from one, you know, from the Baltic Sea out to the Atlantic versus the other way around, then you'll get fresher water in the Baltic. So I don't know if I could quantify, you know, which one is having more of an effect, but um, yeah. This is beyond maybe your own studies, but that made me think broadly to have given that you have this, you know, you, you have some level of ability to identify salinity tolerance among these species now. Um, would that potentially be a way, say, in a sediment record to reconstruct salinity? I mean, would, do you think you'd have enough signal if you were to find fossils and you were able to actually extract, say, DNA or some other piece of information that would tell you about that species adapt adaptability? <laughs> fascinating thing to do. Um, yeah, I mean, if we could go uh, extract DNA and sequence uh, DNA from sediment samples, then we could potentially look for these mutations, see at what frequencies they are, and yeah, reconstruct the, uh, the ancient history of salinity tolerance uh, change through time. That'd be really cool. Yeah. Yes, cool. And Karen also follows up the diatoms, I think, are also traditionally in, used in that way. Cool. All right. Yeah, this is fascinating work, and it's really neat. What What's next for you uh, in terms of your studies? Uh, different possibilities. One, I, I want to. I'm really interested in this idea of fluctuating selection and fluctuating environments, and how that can promote adaptation. And uh, one thing I want to do is look at. Actually, if you could see genes that are changing in frequency across seasons, there hasn't really been a lot of success in other studies to see if this kind of seasonal evolution uh, is happening and I would like to go do that and identify that and see if that is you know the same genes that are promoting invasions um, yeah and then also just I'm looking kind of across other crustaceans other species to see kind of broader patterns and deeper evolutionary time associated with uh, adaptation to different salinity very cool yeah I'm personally curious I study more vegetation atmosphere work and the role of um tidal salinity freshwater intrusion effects on mangroves and, and coastal wetlands and kind of with sea level rise you have a change in the frequency of salinity to, um, and how that would you know how some of your methods could potentially be applied to a system like that and be really fun to, to think about sometime things are evolving and changing or moving across space uh, it has to be pretty quick to uh, for these things to happen in real time interesting yeah Cool. Okay, if there are not any other questions, I'll just check real quick here, then uh, thank you very much for um, coming and presenting and good discussion. Um, just to let folks know we are we have wrapped up for the CPEP seminar series uh, for the fall. For the spring, we're working on probably keeping a similar cadence and frequency to talks. We have a couple of speakers potentially both on and off campus who we might be able to engage on topics as far far ranging as sea level rise to um, coastal uh, dissolved organic matter and carbon cycle feedbacks and uh, 
maybe some other topics if you have some potential ideas. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, whether we'll keep the same time or not is partly dependent on schedules, but we'll make an announcement in December uh, what we're looking for doing in the spring. And in the meantime, I wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving and a good end to your semester. And hopefully everyone's hanging in there. Uh, we're almost there. Okay, very good. So thanks a lot. Take care.